<laughs> Very good morning. Uh, I believe this is my first guest appearance in 2024 and I should say Blessed New Year also. Uh -huh, yeah, yeah. And just in case we don't know, uh, it's also uh, that today is the actual uh, uh, New Year of an uh, ethnic group in Myanmar called Gayin. Today is their uh, uh, New Year. Any, any Myanmar is Gayin? Yeah? No? 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 <laughs> okay. Mm. I want to thank uh, 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 Philip for Deacon Philip for saboing me. <laughs> he was introducing saying uh, this pastor run a lot, cycle a lot, uh, bocho kang. <laughs> okay, you can introduce like that. Don't go to my church and say I'm. Gonna... <laughs> but I do have a reason, uh, a very good reason for being involved in the cycling and running. Uh, but I usually run by on my own by cycle in a group, uh, because being a pastor for this many years, honestly, all my friends are Christians, church members, no external contact. Uh, so very easy, if I, I'm not careful, I'll become a church rat. <laughs> so being in a cycling community, in a group there, I'm in, in touch with the non-Christians, where I can live out uh, being uh, and acting as a children of God, where the rubber hits the road among non-Christians. How would I act? What would I do? What would I not do when I'm in front of them? Mm. Uh, so that's my joy and also uh, by God's grace uh, through this cycling and all that uh, managed to reach out to quite a number of people and also to reach out to some backslided Christians. Sunday morning go cycling, do you want to go to church? <laughs> well, let's pray. Father, we give you thanks that we can shine for you in every arena of life, not just on Sunday, but each day where you have sent us in our professional calling, even at home, even in the market, even leisure, we can shine for you, we can go and disciple for you. So as we come to your word again, to hear from Grandfather John, your apostle, grant us the grace to understand, grant us the grace to live, to be and act as children of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Just nice. Just change the I notice the light tower no more. <laughs> you know, one of the things that I lament uh, the most of my childhood that I was shared in the camp uh, is that I grew up with an absent father. Mm. So, uh, to be honest, I told my wife, I can't remember even a single event where my father brought me out for an outing. I can't even remember a single event. Uh, whether it is my school staff graduation or whatever, he was never ever present. And that was why when I got married, uh, the first on item on my parenting uh, uh, checklist was that I want to invest my life in the lives of my children. So when the first boy come, more so uh, being the first born and a boy, I made a point to play, to run and swim and cycle with him. <clears throat> um, yeah, one of the things that I promised them is that I will get myself as fit as possible so that I can run and do all kinds of things with you all. Uh, so maybe the younger fathers here something for you to think about. <laughs> yeah. And as I, he grows, my son grows, I also need to be willing, humble myself to learn from him. You see, see here, well, who looks more like a professional in softball? <laughs> he teach me again all the tricks and all that. Mm. Uh, and I did all this really not so much to have fun, uh, of course I have lots of fun, but really to add memories and bonding to my, our father-son relationship. And in the midst of it, I get the opportunity to nurture my son now to prepare him for the future. So people often describe us as you know, like father, like son. Uh, but beyond the looks, I'm convinced beyond the look, it is really more about how a father expresses keen interest and actively participates in the growing up of the son. 
And that's actually the big idea that John was writing today in this passage. God, the Father, started His good work in us Christians the moment we believe in Christ. And hence, our life gradually as shaped by the Holy Spirit. We call it the process of sanctification. We will increasingly look more and more like Christ. That's why we are called Christians. So big picture, John's thoughts in this book were bookended by two very important events as he reflected on being and acting as children of God. Now in chapter 2, verse 28 to chapter 3, verse 3, if you have your Bible, your gadgets, do feel free to open to them. John thought about being and acting as children of God in the light of Christ's second coming. Okay, that's the first event. So the book ending event in chapter 3 verses 4 to 10, John ruminated about being and acting as children of God in the shadow of Christ's first coming. <clears throat> so, being and acting as children of God when He appears, second coming. And since He appeared, the first coming, first Christmas. Let's take a look at the first thought. <clears throat> you know, my little nephew broke something at home. Uh, and when his mother returned, my little nephew walked up to the mother with his hand in his back. And then told his mother what happened, I broke something. And then after telling the story, he brought his hand in front. Guess what he showed his mother? He passed his mother a cane. <laughs> you cannot win him, right? Yeah. How to punish like that, right? So sweet. <laughs> so for John, Christ's second coming was not what if or when he, uh, when he appears with a question mark. No. When John thought about Christ's second coming, it was when he appears. It is an exclamation. It was sure and certain. The New Testament uses four words to describe Christ's second coming. His coming, parousia, appearing, phenerosis, epiphany or epiphania, revelation, apocalypses, four words. And there are very few places where these words were used one, a two or three or four all together. But when these words were used together, it was used to send a very strong and urgent message. It is a kind of a warning. See that when Christ comes, there will be no middle ground. It is either we draw near to Him, we are able to draw near to Him in confidence, or we will shrink from Him in shame. There is no middle ground. Perhaps John was thinking about Malachi, chapter 3, verse 2, where the same combination of second coming terminologies were used. The refiner's fire, as we know, is where impure dross are consumed, burnt away. Now, please don't be misled by the harmless word soap, the fuller's soap here. The fuller's soap actually is similar to our modern industrial chemical white washing. So the picture is quite clear. When Christ comes, only those who can stand up to God's refining and cleansing may be able to see Him and face Him. And that's where the challenge is, right? I mean, where we are perfectly honest with ourselves about the way we live, none of us are able to stand up to God's divine purification when Christ comes. So how? What to do? John continues his argument in verse 29. He said, when we practice righteousness, we are also proving that we are indeed born of the righteous God, like Father, like Son. 
And that was why John was so, so happy when he got this assurance that he broke out in praise. Behold, what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called the sons of God. I'm sure we are all very familiar with this song, right? Eh? Let's sing it together, shall we? Okay. Then we sing the bottom part in Greek. Mm. Eh? And then after that, you can walk out and say, I can do Greek. Mm. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. That we should be called the sons of God. That we should be called the sons of God. Let's do it in Greek. Idete pota pen aga pen dedo ken imino patie. Idete pota pen aga pen dedo ken imino patie. He na rekna se o Christo men. He na rekna se o Christo men. Okay, all you've graduated already. <laughs> Behold, what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called the sons of God. And then John continued after the song. He said, when he said the reason why the world does not know us. The reason why the world does not know us is not literal. Right? Of course, people around us know us. So what does John mean when he says that the reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. <clears throat> what he was saying is that when Christians live out the Christian life out there on the streets, when the rubber hits the road, when we are faced with difficult situations, difficult decisions, we chose the road less traveled. We choose to insist on maintaining our Christian testimony that we are so different from the wisdom of the world that it sets the world wondering why this person is so different. Why this person is so different? Why didn't he teach for that? Why he chose to suffer rather than to get even? Just as Paul said in Titus, <clears throat> right? remember, in, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works and your teaching show integrity, dignity and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil, evil to say about us. Now remember what I said in the last sermon? Anyone can remember? And in camp. Over a few days, a Christian son or daughter is a better son or daughter. A Christian neighbor or friend is a better neighbor or friend. A Christian boss or worker is a better boss or worker. A Christian stranger is and must be a better stranger. And all in all, a Christian someone must be a better someone. And John's reason for all this is that the world is temporal. We live and we look forward to Christ's eternal world when He comes. That is our guiding point. And for some, to be ready when He comes, maybe among us here, is to persevere in hardships and challenges. And if you are one of these this morning, do know that you are precious, very precious in God's sight. See, 
what kind of love the Father has given to you, His only Son. And for some of you, to be ready when He comes means sacrificing your hard-earned luxury and possessions because you want to share it with others for the work of the church, for the work of the gospel. And I believe many of you are doing just that. And I thank God for you all. So what John was really driving at in this first segment is that whether you are persevering in hardships or offering yourself in love, John reminds that all this are really evidences of our sanctification, of your sanctification, of your transformation that was made possible since Christ appeared and gave his life for you, that you truly belong to God. So as I said in the first section, John argues that what we truly hope for is attested to by our being and acting as children of God. And now in this second section, John argues that our being and acting in reality attest to whether we are truly children of God or not. Now he's saying that Christ's first coming was to remove sins and to destroy the work of the evil one. To be born again, dying to Christ and being raised with him presupposes a new life. Agree? When we say that we are born again, that we have died with Christ and rose again with Christ, presupposes that we have a new life. And the fact is so important to John, so fundamental to a Christian that John repeated this argument twice. That we are born again, that we are a new creation, and that we will and must reflect this new identity, this new life was so important in this second passage that he repeated himself twice. If you look at your Bible, verses 4 to 7 and verses 8 to 10, basically they are the same thing. If I remember correctly, the last time I came, I did remind you that when scriptures repeats itself, it is an emphasis. Let's take a closer look. John first introduced the antithesis of the gospel. He said, whoever makes a practice of sinning, referring to those who knowingly, repeatedly, and habitually sins. I, I personally would have preferred the other versions for this, for this passage, Again, uh, like King James Version or the NIV, which says, everyone who sinned or whosoever commit a sin. Because sin is universal. Every sin, whether single or habitual, is an act, is an offense against God. But I do understand the ESV translator's intention in the light of their overview of John's writing. Because earlier in 1 John 2, 1 to 6, he made clear, John made clear that he does not teach sinless perfection. <laughs> what a comfort, right? When you say that. When you are born, once you are born again, you will no longer uh, uh, sin or that you cannot ever sin. Uh, because where we are honest, we all fail. <laughs> so John was not teaching sinless perfection. We can never be perfectly free from sin. We strive towards perfection, but we cannot attain it at least not in this life. Not in this world. So what do we do when we fall into sin? John already tells us. God gave us a way. God gave us His grace that we can come and confess to Him. And He is gracious. He will forgive us. Confessing means we first acknowledge that we are sinners and we have sinned. Right? If a person comes to God and say, uh, well, God is a lapse of judgment. God said, I cannot help you. And when, you have, when we come before God and say, God, God, I have sinned. God can tell us, I have a good news for you because I have a Savior. Lapse of judgment, do not need God. 
And when we confess to God, says, I have sinned, and God says, I have a Savior. Mm. And when, by confession, it also means naming the sin committed and accepting responsibility for it. And that is the biggest distinction between a sin and a habitual sin. The habitual sin is marked by this, secrecy and darkness. And according to John, this kind of sin is lawlessness. And the devil is himself is lawlessness personified. Anyone who sins thus proves a twofold jeopardy of being proven at least under the control of the devil, or worse, being belonging to the devil. And the second and worst jeopardy is that it proves true that the person does not belong to God. As I've said earlier, there are no middle grounds. God and sin cannot coexist. And that was why John next explained the purpose of Christ's first coming. He appealed to his readers' knowledge. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins and had broken the devil's bondage over man. You know in him there is no sin. John was saying that it is possible, it is possible to live a life of spiritual victory. Remember, John was at the foot of the cross. He witnessed how the Lord Jesus lived. He witnessed how the Lord Jesus died. And if you were to turn to Matthew 27 and you remember that sin at the foot of the cross. When the Lord died, John witnessed the sky darken, the temper curtain torn, the earth quaked, the graves opened, and the deceased saints resurrected. And subsequently, after that happening, John too witnessed how the apostles and believers remember what happened the night when Jesus was arrested. They ran away like chickens. But after Jesus' death and resurrection, when they met the risen Christ, these little cats became lions. The apostles and believers, instead of running away from death, they chose death over denying Christ. See the change in their life when they truly experience the resurrected power of the risen Christ. So the logical conclusion for John was that no one who abides in him who are truly born of God will keep on sinning and makes a practice of sinning. I know it kind of sounds categorical of John to draw this yes or no line. So John explained why in verse 9. Firstly, God's seed abides in him and that he has been born of God. This seed that God has planted in us is none other than the anointing of God and who is none other than the Holy Spirit who anointed the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can only imagine the source of strength and power that is residing within us. We have been imputed the Holy Spirit. Think about how much we can do for God. Think about how much we can resist and stand up for God wherever you come face to face with a difficult or tempting situation. You can. We can. And that was why John reverted back to his grandfatherly tone. And if my paraph I may paraphrase verse 7, something like this. Little children live to prove that you are children of God and not the children of the devil. And what is the litmus test of that? The litmus test of that is this <clears throat> to love your brother to love your brother or and sister 
if we love someone, whether Christians, non-Christians, or even stranger, we love that person as a creation of God. How would we want to do something against that person? Agree? So the next time, if you come face to face with a challenging situation or person, remember that you are called to love him. Love her, even if it is a stranger, even if it is a very difficult person, because when you are reminded, we are reminded to love the person. We will not tit for tat, and we will be able to respond in a loving manner, a manner where that God would want us to, a manner where it will reveal that we are truly living and acting as a child of God. So that's where John wrapped up. His entire argument. But allow me to conclude with a quotation and a video on how gospel transforms lives. I love this beautiful quote from John Stott, one of my favorite author. <clears throat> He says the new birth involves the acquisition of a new nature through the implanting within us of the very seed. Or life-giving power of God. Birth of God is a deep, it's a radical, it's an inward transformation, and it exerts a strong internal pressure towards holiness. You know, it has always been my conviction after these years as a pastor that one cannot be touched. By the gospel, and yet not transformed. Agree? If we say that I am a new creation in Christ, that the gospel is so powerful, believe in Jesus, and you will be changed. It defies thinking that <clears throat> if the gospel is what the Bible, the Bible says it is. And what the believers and the martyrs of old prove that it is, then it cannot be that we go to church Sundays after Sundays, years after years, for one, five, ten, twenty, thirty years, and yet remain unchanged. So our lives must be changed, if ever so slowly, day by day. I remember there's a little Sunday school song, song uh, that says day by day, I'll change a little bit, something like that, right? Mm. Mm. Huh? Day by day, right? Little by little. Ah, little by little, little by little in every way, little by little in every day, Jesus is changing me, He's changing me, right? Mm. But we'll sing another day, lah. <laughs> I would like really to end with this very powerful video to see how the gospel transform not just a life, not just a tribe, but five head hunting and fielder tribes deep in the jungles of Papua New Guinea. Can you turn on the volume here? It was 50 years ago when my mother and my father began an unforgettable journey. I was just seven months old when they moved deep into the jungles of Papua. We made our home among a small tribal group known as the Sawi. The Sawi were headhunters. They were cannibals. They lived in a constant state of war. As time passed, we began to lose hope that the gospel would take root. My parents were faced with a decision. Finally, Dad explained to the Sawi that if they kept on fighting, we could no longer stay. But the Sawi were desperate to keep us around, so they finally agreed to make peace with each other. In order for that to happen, each Sawi village gave an infant, a baby boy, to their enemies, and this child became known as the Peace Child. It was through this unexpected exchange. Buried deep in their culture, that my parents were given a perfect opportunity 
to share the gospel with the Sawi, to explain to them that God sent his very own peace child, Jesus, to make peace with us. I'm encouraged that these tribes that used to be mortal enemies are so close to each other now. They, they see themselves almost as one. The old tribal barriers and divisions that I sensed and knew as a child have long since broken down and they really feel themselves as being one people. Our trip to Kamur and the reunion with the Sawi reminded me what an incredible privilege it is to join God in his journey to the nations. And it makes me wonder how many more people around the world are still waiting to experience what the Sawi have experienced. I invite you to close your eyes and to respond in your, with your own prayer to what you have just heard and what you have read of the Word of God this morning. That indeed the Gospel changes life, the Gospel transforms life. And that you will allow the Spirit to speak to you, to see if there are any areas in your life that needs to be surrendered to Him for His cleansing, for His transformation, to make you to be what God wants you to be and what you yourself will surely want to be. Father, we thank you again for your word. Lord, I thank you for the prayer of your people which has just been said and offered unto you. Lord, you know their lives. Above all, you know their desire to want to live for you and where you call to die for you. May not be literal, but they were willing to die to self that they may live for Christ and I ask Father that you will honour their prayer especially in the grinds in the rut of everyday life each day you will fill them afresh with your grace with your strength that they may rise in whatever circumstances shining for you living for you. Trust my dear brothers and sisters here in Herod unto Lord your loving hands. Bless them Lord that you may use them. In Jesus name. Amen.